But I got at a group down in Merced that we, we cut an album, or we cut a single, actually, for Challenge Records. The band was called The Brogues. Good fucking band. Really good band. The band came apart, and then I moved back up to San Francisco, and that's when I ran into John. I was living in this chick's basement, and he came over to see me uh, because the chick I was staying with had seen him at a club, and that's when everybody was trying to get in a band, looking for musicians. And he came over to see me, and his car broke down, and he stayed there for four or five days. And that's kind of how the band started, you know. David was in jail then for smoking pot, and so was Dino. And uh, we just started playing in the basement, and then uh, we got a gig doing a rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner for the committee, for Howard Hessman, because that was the height of being just totally like sticking it in your face was to do a rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner, which is what they wanted. So that's what we, then I think they paid us like 150 bucks and a half a kilo of reefer, you know. <laughs> And we, we took the money and we moved all together on a houseboat and had enough dope to get us through the winter, you know. And we kind of like never really seriously considered being stars or actually playing that game at all. You know, I mean, we were perfectly happy to just like smoke dope and go play in Fillmore and Avalon. Nobody had aspirations to be like big time. I mean, I already had been. You know, the gig I started out in the casinos, if I could get that back now, I, Jesus, man, I had it made, man. This was like 1960, 61. I was making about 500 bucks a week. I had a, a 51 Buick Roadmaster convertible, canary yellow with black leather interior and a black top and chrome wire wheels. I had 26-year-old showgirls. I had a, a tailor that made my suits. I mean, you know, I had it made, you know. You know, I, you had to dress up, and I had a guy that just gave me clothes to wear, you know. And I was a young, good-looking kid, and I wore clothes good, and so, you know, I was doted on, man, and it was fucking, you know, I was making a lot of money, and then all of a sudden, bam, I went to prison. It was over, you know. If I could get that back now, I'd have thrown away all the San Francisco shit for it. I'd, I'd still be there, you know. I mean, look at Wayne Newton. <laughs> <laughs> what were those early days like? You'd play at the uh, Matrix, you play at the Fillmore? It was just really crazy, man. A lot of drugs, a lot of people stoned. I mean, just unbelievable. It's like hard to describe. It's like the, the a Avalon, especially, was just loose, man. I mean, it was like we would play the Avalon one weekend, uh, Fillmore the next and then the Avalon and the Fillmore. You know, I mean, that's what we did. We'd go into town every weekend and play one of those other, sometimes be Longshoreman's Hall. We never went out of town. I mean, sometimes Modesto or, you know, San Jose or something like that. But we stayed in town until 67, uh, when the, the Monterey Pop Festival happened, and then all of a sudden, everything just blew up. Everybody got a record deal, and, you know, and then we lasted for another year. We were all Virgos. Yeah, which is odd too. We were all the same birth sign. We had two birthdays. John and David were born on the same day, and me and the drummer, we were born on the same day. But we were, me and the drummer were born on the same day, same year, same hospital, you know, which is really bizarre. So we had all these people hanging around us that were like astrologers and magicians and, you know, occultists and stuff. So we kind of had that whole atmosphere of mysterious shit going on. For us, we took LSD and played music. We did. Now, I, Paul Kantner says nobody can take LSD and play. And he claims that the Jefferson Airplane never did that. And maybe they probably didn't, you know, but we did. It was an integral part of what we did. I mean, we took acid and played together, you know, a lot of acid, you know. That was part of our whole ceremony. Uh, I left a group. Halloween night, October 1968, because I was strung out on speed. And I had to quit, and I, I couldn't do it anymore. Exactly a year later, Halloween night in 69, we played a gig with Quicksilver, me and Dino, you know? And then they said they had three shows and they were gonna go to Hawaii. 
would we go too? And I, I said, I don't want to do it. Dino said, ah, we need to do it because we need to get in a band. So I said, oh, all right. So we ended up in Hawaii, and they had Nikki playing with them then. And then they said, well, we, go on a, we got to do an album. Let's do an album. And Dino said, well, if we do an album, we got to do it in Hawaii, which was a real stupid move. Of course, we had a lot of fun, but, you know, we spent about two months over there. Big house. Everybody had a, a, a convertible. We had a helicopter. We had a sailboat. We had everything, man. And it cost us so much money that it took, right after that, David left the band. John left the band with Nikki and went to CBS. Everybody kept blaming me for making John leave the band. I kept saying, I didn't make him leave. I mean, how? I wasn't even in the band. I mean, how do you have a band and hire two guys to come in and do a record with you, and then because you don't like them, you leave the band and give it to them? I mean, that doesn't make any sense, you know? John got a deal with CBS for Copperhead. My feeling about his plan was that when we did The Fool, on the first album we did, the solo he played on that song was the best I ever heard him play. He actually accomplished his style and everything all came together at one point where it was in tune and it was great, you know? 